So, Tom, thank you for joining me on this uh, first episode of Who's Zooming Who. Um, you're, you're most welcome. Um, thank you very much. I said I might as well start at the top and work my way down. Um, <laughs> so. right, well, that, that could be reversed, but we'll, I'll take the compliment as it is. So what, what prompted me to actually finally do something about this idea that I've been talking about for a long time um, was your event next week, Gas to Goes Global, um, mm. that I probably know too much about. Um, but just for the uninitiated out there and people who don't know anything at all, could you give us a bit of background as to um, why this event, why now, and what do people have to look forward to? Uh, well, I suppose, yeah, uh, first of all, for people who are not familiar with GASTA, and hopefully if they're listening to this, they might also be clicking onto the website. Uh, as I said, the idea is to get people involved. Um, I think often we see people and they're at conferences and they find it very hard to stick to time. Uh, so the whole idea of GASTA was making sure that people stick to the five minutes. It's actually interesting, I was doing a GASTA last year in uh, at the Alt Conference in Edinburgh, and it was it was brilliant because I actually done three sessions one day after another, and on the third day uh, somebody came up to me and said, I'm in, "I know I'm going to go to Gosta because I know even if it's not very interesting that you will stop them after five minutes." Uh, but they also love the whole clapping and cheering, and I suppose that's the thing there because I think that you know learning can be so serious and po faced. And I mean, the idea is, you know, as I said, it should be a bit about engagement. I mean, the one thing I love about Gus, as I said, if, if somebody does a five minute presentation, I always encourage participants and or, or the, the people who are in the audience to go up and talk to the participants afterwards, the presenters and say, you know, look, it, it stimulates that idea. So there is a serious thing about it. That there is a message out there. So the Gus, as I said, if anybody looks on, on any of the, the clips or the links, uh, they'll see that idea of not just counting, but clapping and cheering and stamping and stuff. Particularly, I think it goes down well at the end of a long day, of a conference day, like the, the four to five session there when, when people are starting to nod off. I can assure anybody uh, that if you haven't been to a Gosta session, uh, anybody who's been to a Gosta session will know what I mean. You don't fall asleep um, at a Gosta session. So hopefully we're going to try and recreate as much of that as possible. So, I mean, obviously we'll be getting people to clap and cheer along some of them will be able to will be able to actually hear but we also want people to take photographs and videos of themselves and upload it so you know i'll be working on the assumption and all the presenters will be working the assumption that we have hundreds of people hopefully around the globe who are actually joining in and clapping and cheering them this is a shout out for clint land as well over there in vancouver or anybody else in bc campus world to get uh, to get involved so and as opposed to the thing with the goes global then um Claire Thompson in University of Ulster, she had put up a blog there about two weeks ago and she actually mentioned about Gosta and she says, no doubt Tom Farley is thinking of something, which I must admit at that stage I actually wasn't. Um, but very rapidly I sort of I, you know, I sort of said, you know, maybe we can do something. And I've seen it there, like I've taken part in a lot of webinars and, and stuff there. And I think we're never gonna have a better time. So when am I gonna get the likes of, you know, Martin Weller and Mahabali and, and Tony Bates and, 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 and the likes of that sort of people then. So, I mean, we're never going to have a more captive group of people who are willing to, to help out. And if there's one thing I love about the EdTech community, there is a great willingness to share and to be involved. I mean, I'd have to say, everybody I asked, they responded um, straight away. So there was, there was no problem at all. So, um, you know, there's loads more people we could have got involved, but it is a fine line between not making it too big. It's not a it's not a conference per se. The idea is that five minutes, and the idea that you know we can be telling everybody to stop, even if it is, um, you know, eminent professors and and esteemed colleagues, they will be told to start or stop like that. So I think that and I think that's part of the thing. But you know, I I think also then like you know, imagine what what online or what education would be like afterwards. Because I think there's no doubt, um, I think we have crossed the Rubicon um, in, in the, this very, very challenging time. Uh, I don't think we'll see uh, EdTech as something sort of adjunct or supplemental. I think from here on in, it's gonna have to be the the way we, we do our business. So I thought this gave an opportunity to, to, to share, have a little bit of fun uh, while we're recognizing that it's a challenging, uh, time but also I think it's an idea of solidarity and coming together and I think that's the idea I like the idea that wherever you're sitting you know that you're sitting there and you know you're swaying and counting and you know that hopefully that there's someone 
in the four corners of the world is is doing the same and i think there's something nice about that i think that's that's you know i don't know if that's a competent answer but that's probably trying to give you a sense of yeah no 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 it's it's, it's, it's very good it's 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 it's, it's, it's certainly making me look forward to it early i was actually remembering back to um my my one and only uh guest uh, appearance uh i think as uh ed tech 2018 and carlo carlo yes um, you you were, you were very disappointed that i managed to stick to the five minutes it um, ruined it ruined my day i mean it was certainly <laughs> i mean like, i know i should be impartial but there's certain people if when i see them on their list of the gusta it does sort of uh it does sort of raise a smile and pique my interest and that's all i'll say about that but yeah. uh, yeah, I, I have know. i haven't uh, attempted that fate again uh, since tom um no. I, i'm much happier to, to, to fade into the background now and uh, try and help you with, with the event next week. Yeah, so, and yeah, and just like technology, you've been a great help. I mean, like it's it's the website is is unbelievable, and and uh, you know Shane and Garrod and Christina in 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 CIT well have really helped pull this together. Yeah, no, it's it's been absolutely fantastic, and look, I've been delighted to be involved, and um, it's great um, as opposed to, to 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 rub shoulders with giants like yourself. Um, <laughs> You're obviously talking about like as in a prop forward sense of uh, joints. Well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I, I don't know that you, you ever played prop forward though, Tom, but look, maybe, maybe you did. I, I don't know. No, in my younger, slimmer days, I was number 12 or 13, would you believe? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I wouldn't. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so in terms of the event next week, um, we have seven speakers. Um mm -hmm. I know some of them. I don't know all of them. Obviously, you know all of them. So perhaps you could just give us a quick run through of. Um... Uh, I, I wasn't expecting that. One. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tom, they're your speakers. Um, yeah, you go on the website quick. It's it's all yeah. there. It's all, it's all there. <laughs> Can we just pause this a second? <laughs> uh, no, Ken, <laughs> you've got me up. <laughs> we, we, oh we'll probably God. have to edit out the laughing maybe we won't i don't know we will uh, <laughs> yeah okay um so mahabali um in egypt i mean one of the most um preeminent sort of uh, thinkers around the whole open education movement but also i suppose giving a sense of of you know the that side of where we need to be considering about the the different aspects of of online learning and her talk is about the care and socio-emotional dimension of online learning we have to remember that i think obviously at the time of covid19 we are into really i mean i know we keep using the word unprecedented but one of the big things is that need to to be caring and compassionate um i was quoting and apologies to rajiv janjani from vancouver and but he, he had a great quote up there and he was talking about that and I'm paraphrasing, but he said that a year from now, your students will struggle to remember what you put up, but what they will remember is your connections, your compassion, your humanity, that sort of stuff. And I think that's what we really need to think about that um, we can, you know, it is education and technology, but it's about education and it's about relationships and connections. And I suppose that's the thing that, you know, I think we needs to be considered apart from, we, we're all getting caught up about technology and different conference, you know, uh, platforms and connectivity, and they are certainly uh, uh, of issue there. But I think we you know we need to have that aspect. Um, Martin Weller, um, well known as well in, in 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 the field from the Open University, um, one of the earlier pioneers. And I suppose just thinking about he's talking his title, but the robustness of distance education there, like that. And I suppose it's I think just my own sense that we need to think about. Uh, how robust is it? I mean, it is certainly, um, I think it's robustness is going to be tested over the next few months. But I think, uh, as I said, we, we need to be to be ready and think about how how, re how, how well that's going to be. Um, going across the Atlantic then to, to Lee Graves Wolf, uh, another uh, person I followed for a long time and I was absolutely delighted that she's taken part in the, in the, uh, the, the gossip. And she's talking about the dimensions of presence, and I thought that that sort of thing going back to about the the 
the, the different aspects of how we teach and how and how we sort of create that idea of presence, cognitive and social presence. You know, we have to have that sense. I mean, how are we, how are we going to convey that it's it's not somehow lesser than real education um, or face to face education? Um, we have to, you know, go back to the, to the thing about Martin Weller's point about the whole robustness. But I, I think one of the things which gives online education a, a robustness is where we really put our heart and soul into establishing presence and as I said it's not seen as an adjunct it's not seen as something secondary it's seen something as, as real um, I love Mark, Mark Brown from uh, he's the, the fourth chair of the digital um, learning and director of the National Institute for Digital Learning in Dublin City University so while well, we have an Irish uh, representative but he's also a Kiwi so I, I suppose that was kind of helping me stretch the gas to go as global so we have a someone from the, the uh, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and I love his title, uh, Building Creative Mindsets, Singing or Pumping It Down a Pipe. I suppose, you know, an, an allusion to, to that idea that, uh, paraphrasing W.B. Yeats, about that education should be about lighting a fire, not just filling a pail. So I think, as I said, like <clears throat> one of the things that I get a sense of is that although we are doing a lot of online education now in the midst of, of, of this uh, pandemic. I think for some people they may be perceiving it as it'll do just until we until we get back to normal. Um, so I suppose like that, you know, they're, they're the sort of issues then that we need to look about about how we're going to create that that different mindset. Um, going up to the Isle of Lewis then, uh, Frank Rennie from the University of Highlands and Islands. So if ever there was a distributed university, it is UHI. And uh, I think Frank is very, very well placed to sort of talking about, you know, the value of it. I mean, because they have been doing this for a long time. And as I said, he's actually talking about going online education can be better than face to face. And I, I think as well, like some people have sort of pointed out, oh, what about face to face? But, you know, you know, we've all taught, or some of us have taught in places where, you know, you could have 150, 200, 300 students. So where's the level of quality of interaction necessarily there that it's so superior to what we do in, a, in an online world? Um, also sticking with, with, with Scotland, um, the outgoing chairperson of ALT, uh, Sheila McNeil, and another very, very experienced um, uh, educator, online educator, I think her title is, is quite provocative in terms of where we're, what happens next. Will we just revert to business as usual? And I suppose that's the one thing that, you know, as, as education technologists, we do need to consider, like, are we just being seen as a great sort of firefighting thing at the moment? But going forward then, when, when all this dies down, you know, what will happen? Or, I mean, I started off talking about how we crossed the Rubicon. I'm not, hopefully we have. But yeah, I suppose it will will remain to be to be seen. And and finally, then um, Tony Bates, um, he'll be joining us from Vancouver, one of the most uh, well known and well esteemed uh, people in the ed tech uh, community. Then and he, you know, say what are the affordances of, of face to face and how does that all all fit in with us? So hopefully, I think we we, we have people here who are going to look at what we what we were coming from, how we maintain it, what could be the future, but things we need to be sort of, to be just aware of and be careful of. So hopefully, um, you know, there's something for everybody there. That's what I'd like. And I suppose that's the great thing. The five minutes, and that's the great thing. These are big, big names, but they still have to go, hey, no, three, car, Kuig, Gosta, and do it within five minutes. So 35 minutes, we'll have the, the history, the present, and the future of online learning. Um, <laughs> Something like that. Something I think like you were probably more than five minutes introducing them there, Tom. So, um, I probably was. Yeah, well, you, you, took me, you, you took me a little bit off. I should have been better prepared. I know, it, it, you're, you're absolutely fine. This is, this is uh, the, 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 the spirit uh, of the whole thing. You, you said a couple of interesting things, um, and I guess... Uh, there, there's some things that would resonate with myself and um, as you know we, we've, we've worked together on a couple of projects in the past um, and for people maybe who don't know me just to explain um, my own background or my own current role is as head of technology enhanced learning in Waterford Institute of Technology um, but I arrived here by accident um, having sold cars fresh fruit and veg 
uh, Christmas trees, uh, petrol, and a variety of other uh, jobs down through the years. I'm a, I'm a technologist at heart, so um, I see the technology as almost a solution to every problem, but only insofar as it goes to make life better. It's not technology for the sake of technology. So it's, you know, what, what's this doing for me? Um, I think you touched on, on, on a couple of really interesting things there um, around the connection and making connections with people and uh, affording people the ability to communicate. Um, and certainly, I think even though we're all stuck in our homes, um, or at least supposed to be stuck in our homes uh, at the moment, we're probably reaching out beyond those four walls uh, better than ever. And I struggle to imagine what, what this current um, uh, quarantine or lockdown or whatever title you want to give it would have been like 10 or even 15 years ago before mm. um, widespread adoption of broadband and and the kind of technology that we're using now. I mean, you're sitting in um, Kerry and I'm here in Waterford and mm. um, amazingly neither the two of us are in Cork and we're still managing to talk. <laughs> yeah, the yeah the People's Republic of Cork, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you're right. No, I think you know that that technology has made th those affordances of of uh, of technology have made you know made things possible. But like like yourself, I'd often classify myself as a critical technophile in the sense that I do really like technology and what it can afford. And and as I said, I've been at graduations where uh, you know we've provided courses there where quite quite simply if online blended learning wasn't possible wasn't available then those people getting a degree would not be possible so but i do think we should always be critical about you know rather than this uncritical acceptance you know look at this new shiny technology what does it do i don't know but it's new and shiny and i i, I think that that's i mean if you look at you know say MOOCs, uh you know five six years ago it was the big thing and it was going to be taking over and the democratization of education and stuff like that. So I think there'll always be something which uh, appeal, appears to be very appealing. Um, but I think um, a, a statement that Eamon Costello and DCU has used a few times, like, you know, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, and I, I, I think that's something there that we do need to be careful of with technology and that we have this technology, what do we do with it? And I, I, I think that's you know that's a question we we need to ask and now then i think things have been so rapidly upscaled i think every college pretty much has, has some sort of virtual learning environment but now they're going to be tested in a way that was never necessarily envisaged for for that level of, of server space for connectivity all sorts of all sorts of issues there like that so yeah I, like yourself i do like technology i think it can certainly provide a lot of answers but um my fear would be now, as I said, we will move into an uncritical phase, and and you know, government, colleges, institutions, everything will start throwing money, and you know, simply throwing money at something without considering how it's going to be used, who's going to provide the support, what type of teaching are we going to to to, to end up with? Um, so, you know, if that's the future, I don't just want sure. That's the so future. I suppose to, you know, and again, I'm probably going to put you slightly on the spot now because I. I'm glad I'm the one asking the questions uh, and you're the one answering them because if you, if you ask me any of these questions, I don't think I, I'd have any good answers. But So you're, you're imagining this, this, this future and, and we've crossed this Rubicon because um, everyone has been forced online um, mm -hmm. in the first instance to complete delivery of, of this semester and in the second instance to uh, undertake uh, some form of assessment. So in this... This, this future um, that you'd like to see, um, what, what's your vision for that? Um, well, I think, with, first of all, as I said, with this semester here, I, I, I would like to think and I hope like the, that a lot of the students will, will, will give their lecturers and their colleges a fool's pardon in some ways, and in the sense that this has really caught us off guard. And I do certainly get a sense, certainly talking to any, any friends and colleagues, uh, both in Ireland and abroad, they really are responding responding well and doing their level best. And I think people will kind of accept that they're doing that. Um, but I think if we don't genuinely learn from it, I don't think people will be as 
forgiving uh, for us. So, as I said, I think that that, that future would be a, a much bigger upscaling of technology use. Now, when I say that, I do want to be very careful. Like, I've always had this mantra, I would rather 90% of the staff use 10% of the available technology. There will always be those early adopters, the people who are going out ahead. Uh, but then there, there, there are people who, who, who are, are, are way, way behind. I, if I would like to see, if we even just all move the bar up a couple of percent so that everybody could do just do at least a certain minimum. So, because once again, we stuff like online learning, I've seen lots of reports uh, from in Ireland and, and abroad, you know, so-and-so college goes online and you kind of go, well, what do you mean by online? They, they, they put notes on, up on their virtual learning environment and email their students, if that constitutes. But as I said, let's consider what is uh, the minimum. Uh, the, the QQI published uh, the its standards on blended learning there about 18 months ago or so. I would like to see that that becomes uh, an integral part of how higher education does its business. So there's at least standards there that that that, that we adhere to there like that. But sure. I mean, e even moving forward, and like, there will only be ever a certain amount of of students who are learning online or blended. They're often the part-time students, but the trouble is like what happens where we see is oh that the online that's the part-time students the distance students and them and i think you know you say what's the vision it's that everybody uses technology the, the standard the standard undergrad degree the person teaching them is making a standard use of the virtual learning environment or whatever the, 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 they're using and everybody adheres to a certain level of standard I, no, that's I, I, what I, I, I think you're absolutely right and i think that level of consistency and just um uh, ad adoption, um, I suppose, across uh, a program uh, rather than just on a, a module by module basis, um, would, would be a, a good a good thing. I, I, Interestingly I, enough, that, yeah. I, 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 I do think that the fact um, that the primary and secondary schools, of course, uh, are around at the same time as ourselves, this is this is helping everyone. I saw as this is how uh, I say affecting everyone. I saw a statistic during the week that there's something like 1.4 billion um, students learning at home right now um, all mm. across the world. So it's a phenomenal number. Mm. Um, and I'd like to think that they are uh, learning something. I, I often feel that um, in some respects, secondary schools and, and perhaps even maybe primary schools, and I don't have uh, children um, of those ages anymore, um, but in some respects that, that they're ahead of the game when it comes to um, what's going on uh, at, at third level. And, and you also touched on a very interesting point there about part-time learners and postgraduate learners. And we're, we're, we're very good at pigeonholing um, our students into boxes that suit us as opposed to um, suit the students. And I have no doubt that most students just see themselves as students. They don't necessarily see all the distinctions and differences that, um, that, that, that we seem to um, want, want to create. Um, but no, I certainly think, you know, I suppose the two things I had hoped, um, if I was to see myself in three months or six months or nine months time, whenever things are back to, um, normal, um, is that people who tried, um, online learning found it to be not as hard as they feared uh, and better than they suspected, um, and yeah, I, I, and I, 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 I'm getting I'm getting a lot of that sense already. To be quite honest with you, and I, I, you just talking about the primary and secondary. I I think I think the the the, the staff working in those places are, are doing amazing jobs because at least like you know pretty much in a higher education you do have a teaching and learning centre. You'll have a technology enhanced learning. You know you'll have sort of resources. You will have a whole infrastructure of a virtual learning environment and resources and stuff like that. Um, you know as I said like. A lot of schools might use Microsoft Office 365, and that's pretty much it. So, I mean, I've been hearing some great uh, stories there, uh, and I have to say, I mean, like, I'm familiar with there's an MA in learning and teaching up in Letterkenny, and they go up once a year to do a, a lecture. And, and like, particularly those working in, in the secondary, but particularly those in the primary, uh, they, the commitment that they show, the resourcefulness with far less 
resources at their fingertips is is amazing. So um, I think hats off to the primary and secondary uh, sector and the further education sector because they don't certainly often have the resources that we have in in the third level sector. So. But um, now going forward, I think as I said, yeah, and I, I agree with your students to see themselves as, as as students, and I think that's going back to Mahabali's point about that care in in an online. Uh, because as I said we can get too bogged down in technology. You know, I mean, I do like the idea, like, you know, of, of creating that relationship, and even just you know finishing off your emails. I hope that you and your family are well in this. Sure. You know, and it's about sort of reaching out and creating that uh and that is that's the whole thing about it like you know at, at the at this at the heart of the education technology is education for me and education is about relationships and connections the technology just allows us as i said the technology does facilitate you and i to talk synchronously um 100 and odd miles apart uh, and that's brilliant um but uh, absolutely and it is um it always comes back to, to connections, um, and, and I suppose just just I'm conscious I'm taking up a lot of your time, and I'm conscious that if there is anybody who's listening to this, they're probably uh, sick, sick and tired of the, the, the sound of the two of us by now. But um, I'll finish off on this, Tom. Um, yeah. and I'll share I'll share it with you. So my my dad's older brother, um, who uh, joined the Christian Brothers, um, or the De La Salle Brothers at 14, um, but came out and um, got married and, and had two children. He actually passed away, uh, sadly, at the start of um, March. Um, but he was a retired uh, primary school headmaster. Um, and unfortunately, because of the timing um, of all this, I didn't get to uh, go over to his funeral, but. On Facebook, um, on the school page for the school that he was the uh, headmaster for, um, and he's retired, I think, almost 20 years at this stage. Um, the absolute outpouring from previous students of his, and these are like kids who would have been in primary school in the, in the 80s and early 90s, um, and still, here we are um, 30, almost 40 years later, um, remembering him very fondly and saying how um, big a part he played in their lives. And um, even though I wouldn't have seen him all that often, but as it happened, I did live with him for a couple of months um, when I was about twelve myself. Um, so I, I'd remember him from around that time. Um, it filled me with immense pride that you know, being being a teacher, it's a very noble profession, um, and having that sort of impact on, um, I suppose all lives um, and, and how those lives um, un, unfurl and, and, and uh, unwind uh, throughout the future. So I've no doubt that um, students will remember this time uh, and will remember the teachers that, that reached out and possibly went um, above and beyond. Um, so I, I suppose, look, I'll finish up on that. Maybe it's not the, the happiest note to oh, end no, I think, no, I think um, it is. It is, and and that thing about the uh, reaching out and above and beyond it depends on what, what level someone is at. So I mean, if they've moved from here up to here, that's a big leap. Like, and 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 that's the thing. Like, there's no, you know, because the one thing, as I said, like, you know, the technology is just a tool. And as I said, like, if you are committed to providing a good quality education and you're doing your level best. I think that's all we can ask people to do at this present time. Yeah, and I think people see it. Uh, and people, yeah. people notice it. Tom, you've been an absolute star as always. Thanks very much for um, agreeing to this experiment. Um, <laughs> I've no idea what it's going to uh, look like or like. sound like. <laughs> uh, um, but sure, look, I'll, I'll, I'll edit it down. I'm going to stop the recording now. So I'm just going to finish up by saying thank you very much, Dr. Tom Farley. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Ken. <laughs>